Hello, welcome second grade and third grade. I'm Mrs. B and we're going to talk about science. Before I do so, I just want to share with you what we've been doing over and over that I hope you continue to do in the summer to help you make sense of everything that's going on in the world and to help you become a better scientist and engineer. So our five senses are really important in science. Our sense of sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch, feeling. So let's do a quick warm up with our five senses. So share with me something that you see around you right now. How about something that you smell? Is there anything that you're tasting right now? Is there something that you're hearing right now? And is there anything that you are touching or feeling with your hands right now? Okay. The other important key part of science is asking a lot of questions. And so let's warm up with a couple of questions. Think of a question that starts with what? Think of a question that starts with what if? How about when? A question that starts with how. And then a question that starts with why. So always have your five senses ready to go with science and then always have lots of questions about what's going on. And that will help with observations, collecting information, collecting data, and data, we can have numbers to describe what's happening. We can have words to describe what's happening. Today, we're going to go back to forces. And we've talked about forces before, if you joined me before. So a reminder about forces. A force is a push or a pull. And the forces that we've been talking about, we've been talking about balanced and unbalanced forces. And usually, it's forces that we are causing. Today, we're going to look into a couple of forces, static electricity and magnets, that we don't necessarily create or that we're not doing the pushing and the pulling. Other objects are doing the pushing and the pulling. And we will compare and contrast each of these. So let's start first with static electricity. And some examples of static electricity are maybe if you have carpet and you're wearing socks and you're shuffling along and rubbing your socks along the carpet, and then maybe you touch a doorknob or you touch someone else and you feel a shock. You feel some electricity. That's an example of static electricity. Or maybe if you help with laundry and your clothes is drying in the dryer and you pull your clothes out and some socks or some clothes are sticking to each other. That's another example of static electricity. So I want to show you some examples of exploring static electricity at home. You would need a balloon. I brought my friend here. And let's see what other things I brought. I brought a piece of styrofoam. I brought this cup, and so the outside of this cup has styrofoam, even though the inside feels different. So I have a styrofoam cup. I have an index card that I folded in half. I have an aluminum can. I also have small pieces of paper. Okay. And here I have other things too. Let me pull out my small pieces of paper here. Put them on the table. So one way that I can create static electricity is by rubbing this balloon on my jacket. And let me describe my jacket to you. It's soft, it's cloth, it's like a fleece. If you've ever had a fleece or you know what fleece feels like, that's what this is. I'm going to try my fleece out first. And so static electricity is all about 
negative and positive charges. And I made up of negative positive charges and so are you. What do I mean by these charges? Well, electricity has something to do with them. So let's start to explore what I mean by that. So I'm going to put my balloon close to these things and I wanna see what happens. Let's see if I could get that to stand up. Can you see it moving somewhat? Do you see that? Well, there's a little bit of charge there. Can I start to roll this? Let's see. Not too much happening there. What if I put it on these small pieces of paper that I scattered here on the table? Not much going on there. How about this aluminum can? Nothing going on there. How about this piece of paper? Not much going on there. What about a balloon near my hair? Well, let's see. Let me take some hair out. Crazy hair day. I don't feel too much happening. So I'm gonna rub this against my coat here. Let's see what happens. So the balloon has positive and negative charges and my coat has positive and negative charges. And as I'm rubbing this, it's the negative charges that can move. So I'm trying to get the negative charges from my coat to the balloon. And then let's see what happens. So I'm rubbing it against myself here. Okay, let's see if anything happens there. Not really. So I'm going to do it with my hair now. Do you see that? I can hear it. I'm not sure if you can hear it. Let me put my mic closer to see if you can hear what's happening here. Can you hear that? Let me put my mic back on. So something happened here when I rubbed the balloon against my hair. That was a lot more charge here. So now let's test this balloon against some of the objects I brought because I feel like now there's a big charge built up. Hmm. Let's try that again. I'm gonna get crazy hair here. here. Ready? Let's try it against these pieces of paper I have here. Hmm. Am I rubbing it in the right place? Let's see. I'm gonna get crazy here for this. Do you see? that it is pulling, the balloon is pulling the styrofoam cup. Let me try this paper again. Charge it up, and here's the evidence. Something's going on here, pulling on my hair. How about this paper now? Let's try this styrofoam. Oh, it fell on its own, I didn't do anything yet. Let me see, make sure it's gonna stand up on its own and I'm gonna put the balloon close to it. There was no wind blowing. I'll try that one more time. If I can get it to stand up. Here, I'll put it against this cup and see if it'll, it attracts it. It did. Let's try this aluminum can. Do you see that it's pulling on it? Let me try that again. So these are forces that we can't necessarily see with our eyes the way we could see a push or a pull, but there's evidence, there's information we can collect that something's happening here, that there is a pull or a push. When I tried this at home, and I'm not sure if it's not working on this cloth here, 
I was able to get this paper to move. I'm gonna try it one more time. Determined to get this paper to move. Oh, it's not working on here. It's very cool at my house. So this is one form of a force that we don't necessarily see, but that is happening with a positive and a negative charge. The other is magnets. So let's look at some magnets here. These are magnets that I had on my refrigerator and I have quite a few here. Magnets are different from static electricity in that instead of having a positive and a negative side, we have a side that attracts and a side that repels. And we have poles. We have a north pole and a south pole. And the earth is like a magnet. It has a north pole and a south pole. But it's not as strong as maybe some of the magnets we're going to be looking at here. So let's see if you can see what I'm going to do here. I'm going to hold the side of the magnet that is all black. This side is green, it has plastic on it. So one side pulls and one side pushes. One side of the magnet attracts and one side of the magnet repels. So let's see, each magnet has a side that attracts and each magnet has a side that repels. So I'm gonna test these out. Could you see that? Let me try that again. Well, it flipped over. Let's see if I can move it on the table. Well, let me put it on this. Maybe it'll slide along here better. Nope, it's not sliding on this either. Let me grab a piece of paper. See if we could do this better. So this side, do you see that better? I am repelling, pushing, that means that for this magnet, this side and this side are the same because they're repelling each other. That means the other side, the dark side of this one and the green side of this one are opposite and will attract and pull towards each other. Oops. Did I do that wrong? They're both. There we go. These are the sides, I tested that again, that are attracted to each other. These other sides repel each other. Well, it's not, there we go. This repels, this attracts. So let's try a few more because they're all a little different. When I have the dark side on the green side, it's repelling and pushing it. Okay, let's test this one. This side is attracted to this side. Let's test this third magnet. So these two magnets are the opposite of this magnet when I hold it this way, and the magnet in the middle are opposites and are attracted to each other. So let's do a quick comparison. So static electricity has positive, and negative charges. Magnets have poles, a north pole and a south pole. And here opposites are attracting. The negative charge and the positive charge attract each other or two negatives will repel each other. Here we also have opposites, but we have a north and a south. And they both use or have a charge called an electron that moves between the two. So here are some forces that we're seeing. I did not create these magnets, but I am able to collect evidence and push these magnets without me actually doing the push and the pull. One last thing I wanna share with you is a game that you could do with magnets, a fishing game. So I collected some things around my house. I found these lids. Maybe you have some. They're usually on glass jars like this. So I found the lids to those 
jars. I found some other lids. I had to go around my house testing different objects. I have some empty cans here. I have some, some other lids from jars. I happen to have some cookie cutters that are metal. I looked in my kitchen drawers. I found a paper clip and I found a screw and I tested all of these things out with a magnet to see if they would attract or repel. And then I attached a string to my magnet and I put some tape here on my magnet. And you can play a game and maybe you can play who can collect the most items with their magnet the fastest or who can collect the most. And you can put them in a bag, in a box. So I wanted to show them to you. I'm gonna put them all back in this bag and I'm going to go fish with my magnet. You just need one magnet. Maybe you have a refrigerator magnet. Look around and see if you can find a magnet. So I'm gonna go in and I got a can the first time. I got a lid. So turn this into a fun game playing with magnets, testing to see what will attract and repel. Try out different experiments with a balloon and create static electricity. I found that rubbing it on my head is the best way. And see how you can explore other forces besides the ones that we do with our body with a push and a pull or with toy cars. So I hope you have a great summer and I'm so glad you tuned in and joined me. And until next time, I hope you have a great day. Bye. Good morning, mathematicians. Hi, I am Mrs. Sears, and I'm gonna be joined today from, with some of my teacher friends, and we're gonna be doing some math with you. Um, I wanted to welcome you to At Home with APS. The very first thing that we're gonna to do today um, is actually going to be a, a puzzle. It's a puzzle that you may not necessarily be familiar with. Maybe you have in the past done crossword puzzles. Maybe you've done um, puzzles where you're trying to make a picture out. Maybe you've even done tangrams, uh, which is trying to make certain animals or characteristics based on certain shapes. Well, this particular type of puzzle is called a Ken Ken puzzle. And a Ken Ken puzzle is a special puzzle that is done on a grid. As you can see behind me, the Ken Ken puzzle that we're gonna be working on today is on a three by three grid. And I know we've been talking a little bit about like area and perimeter. So you can tell that I have a three by three because number one, it's a square. I have exactly three going vertically and three going horizontally. And those three make a total number of nine separate boxes that I'm going to be having to fill in. So let me explain how this Ken Ken puzzle works. The very first thing that you need to know is that you can only use the numbers one, two, and three in this puzzle. So this is a little bit about math that we're gonna be using because we're gonna be using different operations and it's a little bit of logic. And as I was thinking about this earlier, I actually in my brain mixed it up and I said that it was magic because I took the math, the MA, and the logic, the GIC, and I put those together in my brain and I said, this is actually like magic. <laughs> it's similar to kind of something like you may have seen before, Sudoku, um, but it's a little different in this way. And again, it's because we can only use the numbers one, two, and three, and we are told what the target number is that we're gonna be having to figure out in the puzzle, as well as which operation to use for that specific target number. Now, one thing that you have to also be aware of is we cannot reuse any of these numbers in the same row or the same column. So it's, it's a little bit like, like I said, it's logic and it's kind of using math at the same time. So it's like magic. We're trying to figure out how we're gonna do this. 
So let me describe a little bit about what's happening inside this puzzle. And I wanted it to be very clear um, how I was going to go ahead and um, be solving it. So the, you can see that there's, there's target numbers that are in here, and there's an operation that's also next to that target number. What you can also see is that certain parts of the grid are boxed out around it. So when I have a boxed out section that's around on this Ken Ken puzzle, that's called a cage. A cage is what I'm trying to solve that operation and that target number in. On this particular puzzle, I have five different cages. I have one down here, one here, one over here in the middle, and another to the left, and one up across the top. So I have five different cages that I'm gonna be solving the puzzle on. Now, when I get a cage that just has a number by itself, that's like what we call a freebie or a free space. If you've ever played bingo before, when you have a free space, you already know what's gonna go in there. That's always the place where I like to start because I already know what belongs there. So if we're looking at this particular space, this cage, what would you think goes inside there? A three, yeah, the three is automatically gonna be able to go inside there. It's a free space. It tells us automatically what's going to be happening in there. But when you're thinking about like, remember I can't have the same row and I cannot have the same column. So I know that whatever's in these two boxes cannot contain a three and whatever's in these two boxes cannot contain a three because if I did that, then I'd be violating the rules of what I need to go in there. So what I start to do is I'm starting to try to think about how would I solve the next set of problems? And to me, the next one that I was thinking of trying to do was this one up here, this three, where my target number is a three. And remember, I can only use a one or a two to get that because I don't have an option of a zero. What could I put in there to figure that out? And I was thinking about this. Well, how could, how could I know what to put in there? I know it's got to either be a one or a two. But then I also have to be thinking about like what else could go in these other squares so that I'm not duplicating those numbers. So I'm just gonna try something. I'm gonna go ahead and put a one in this one and I'm gonna go ahead and put a two in this one. Now I have one plus two, which would equal my target number of three. Okay, what should I do next? Well, I know if I'm looking at the five plus, remember, I can't use this one again. I can only use things that add up to five. So the only two numbers that I have left to use are a three and a two. But I've got to figure out which configuration to put them in. And I'm not really quite sure what to do on that. I could try a three here and hopefully I'll be in the right place. I could try a two here and see if that will work there. That might help me a little bit. Mm, but maybe, maybe I should think about doing something else on there too. Hmm, it's complicated. Sometimes you're gonna have to try. I'm gonna try. Because you know what, if I make a mistake, I could go ahead, usually if I had a pencil, I can just erase that. So that's okay. I'm gonna try a three in this one. I'm really thinking that maybe I might have a good shot because I know this three plus has gotta be a two and a one. So somehow the two and the one is gonna be in this section. And maybe if I do a two here, I could still make four with a three and a one besides a two and a two, okay? And I can't complete a two and a two in the same section either. So let's see, we have a two plus three equals the five. Now, which one should I do next? Maybe, maybe let's try this four because I said there's a three and a one in there, right? I've got to figure out which way I can put it in there. I'm thinking I'm going to put the three there. I'm going to put the one there. A three plus a one is a four. Now, is it very clear what I would need to do in this last section? Remember, I can't duplicate any numbers. I've used a one, two, three here. I've used a two and a three here, and I've used a three and a one here. So it's telling me, I think maybe I need to put, I know this is gonna need a one, and this is gonna need a two, so one, two does equal three. I think I might have solved it. That's pretty cool. Definitely, it is magic. It's math and logic. 
I have one for you to go ahead and solve when you have time to get back to this. And also I wanted to let you know that we will have these resources available to you on the APS distance learning site if you would wanna try it. But I'm just gonna kick you off really quick and get you started. What's the easiest one we could do right away? We got that free space, right? I'm gonna get you started on this one and I'm gonna have you finish the rest of it at home. See if you can figure out how to do the rest of this puzzle. Now remember, I have some different operations in there that you might be familiar with. I have a division and I have a times in there for multiplication. Good luck. And if you continue to like these, these would be a great thing to keep honing that math and that logic in there for you. Now we're gonna have Miss Gaudette come on up and she's gonna work on with you with some problem solving problems that you did last week. Hello everyone, and on Tuesday, we were working on a problem called boxing the pots. So remember, if you've not already done so, go ahead and download this, um, this task, or else get out a pencil and paper, attempt it yourself before you listen to how I approached it. My teacher think and how I am thinking through this task. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Last time we read through it, so let's go ahead and review what we've done. At the garden center, Mr. Garcia is putting plant pots into boxes ready to take to the market. The diameter of each plant pot is three inches. Reminder, diameter is the taking a circle, a line from end to end going through the middle. So it's how like wide it is. Each box measures nine inches by 15 inches. And they went ahead and they have given us an example. On number one, it says, how many pots can Mr. Garcia arrange along the side of the box that measures 15 inches? Our work last time, we went ahead and we took our 15 and then figured out by our three with either multiplication or repeated addition we went ahead and said three, 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 three. Three fives is 15, so it was five pots. All right, number two. How many pots can Mr. Garcia arrange along the side of the box that measures nine inches? And we went down saying three, 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 or three times three equals nine inches, so that was three pots. Oh, look at that, I forgot to circle that. Ah, uh, did anybody notice that last time? All right, number three says, how many pots will the box hold? Show how you figured that out. We went ahead and we noticed that we had to go five going across or horizontally, three going down or vertically, and we knew we had to just fill in the rest of pots. So we had five, 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 or five times three is 15 pots. I left you last time with number four, and I had asked you to work on that one and then come back and we would talk about it. So let us talk about number four. So Mr. Garcia has 12 pots. Oh, they're not asking the same thing we did last time. Mm, I can already tell. That are four inches in diameter. They can fit exactly into a different box. We just don't know the size of that box. So that I think is what they're gonna be asking us. What do you think the measurements of the, what do you think the measurements of the box, box are? What is the length, width, and then explain. So let us go ahead and let's start on number four and let's work through it. So I have here number four. I'm gonna go ahead and redraw this to help myself out. That's the information I was given. I was told it was 12 pots and the diameter is four inches. Okay, I'm one of those ones who likes to go ahead and 
put the information that I know that I'm given, it just sometimes helped me think through my work. Okay, so I know I have to have 12 pots. Hmm. And I know I have to have it go a length, a width, but I have to equal 12. So I could probably do like nine and three, right? That would work. That would give me 12 pots. Hmm. No, because remember, we had to have it where it had to have the same amount in each row. So it has to be equal. We can't just have random space in there, otherwise the pots will tip over. All right, so if I had two pots in a row, how many would I have to have going across, all the way across the length? Well, if I had two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, oh. That would mean I would have two going down for my width, and then I would have six going across, but that makes it a very long pot. It would work, but I'm like, I don't want a box that's really long. I want more, my box almost as square as I can get it. Okay, if that's the case, I need my numbers as close as they can be. All right, so I know that if I repeat, if I do three going down, let me try that. I have three, six, nine, 12. I would fill in with no spots, three going down, four going across. Okay, let's see, that looks like it might work. So let me go ahead and try that out. Because remember that we are, they aren't asking how many pots are going across, how many pots are going down. We just need that information to help us. All right, so I know four plus four plus four plus four equals 16. Or four times four equals 16 inches. All right, let me try that out with my there we go, that so far is working. If we have four going across, we just said that we would have to have how many going down for the width? I asked a question and I didn't finish my last question, so I'm just going back and filling that in. The length equals 16 inches. So let's do that, we have four, three going down. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six total. Let me see if I fill it in if it works. So I have four, eight, 12. That does work. Okay, so we're having four plus four plus four equals 12 inches or you could have seen that it was four times three equals 12 inches. So our width would be 12 inches, thank you. All right, I went ahead and I have now said, what do you think the measurements of the box would be? The length and the width, Has, have we gotten that? Length and width. Oh. Ah, did someone catch me on that? I bet you guys were already yelling that at me. All right, and then have I explained how I've gotten that? No, so that's the next part I would have to do. We would have to just say how we figured it out. So I figured out the measurements, and can you finish that for me? I figured out the measurements. By doing what? Did I use the drawing to help me? Yeah. By drawing these circles in. Then what did I do? I multiplied, right? I then multiplied the diameter. I'm gonna use a mathematical vocab word 
of the pots by the number, I'm gonna abbreviate there, of pots. For example, four times four equals 16, and three times twelve uh, four equals 12. And that's how I figured out the measurements of the length. How did you do that? All right, thank you so much for helping me problem solve through boxing the pots activity task. Now we're moving on to Ms. Carnes, and we're going to be doing some more mathematics and literature. All right. Hello, mathematicians at home with APS. It's Ms. Carnes here again to read a story with you. Here we go. All right, guys. Today's story is called Arctic Fives Arrive, and it's written by Eleanor Pinzis, and this is a scholastic book. This book is about groups of five animals that are arriving at an iceberg in the Arctic. I wonder why they're all traveling there. One late Arctic day, not too far from the bay, five snowy owls gracefully flew. They spotted a mound, the tallest around, where small birds could have a nice view. Deciding to light, the owls circled right while making one final survey. It looked like a place with plenty of space for the animals headed that way. So, so far, we've had one group of Arctic Fives arrive, five snowy owls. The five snowy owls, all fine feathered fowls, were peacefully taking their rest, but hoots filled the air as up popped five bears to join them atop the hill crest. Those bears were delighted, but far too excited, each owl hip hopped out of harm's way. The bears rubbed their jaws and licked icy paws. Once groomed, the bears planned to stay. <clears throat> the owls wondered then if the rest would fit in. Counting by fives, that's five, 10. So we have two groups of Arctic fives. Five polar bears on pigeon-toed paws and five snowy owls with long curvy claws. The bears settled down as the owls looked around and spied Ermine making the climb. From 10 occupants came a series of grunts when they shifted themselves one more time. Tiny ears twitched and long whiskers switched on the Ermine surve surveying the view, all anticipating while contemplating if others would climb the hill too. Hmm, how many do we have now? Have you been keeping track? Counting by fives, that's five, 10, 15. Five sly ermine, all pop-eyed and lean, five polar bears on pigeon-toed paws, and five snowy owls with long curvy claws. 15 restless critters, all with the jitters, felt something huge quaking the ground. They heard walrus clapping, tail fins a-flapping, and who knew they'd be next on the mound. Each animal lifted, then suddenly shifted as fat walrus rumbled their way. The five shut their eyes and heaved heavy sighs because of the weight pulled that day. Another group of Arctic fives. Five, 10, 15, 20. Five fat walrus with tusks sharp and keen. The five sly ermine all pop-eyed and lean. Five polar bears on pigeon-toed paws and five snowy owls with long, curvy claws. Twenty animals now, all fitting somehow, saw Arctic hares thump the packed snow. They must move again for the hares to fit in, though there wasn't much space left to go. The pert Arctic hares all wiggled their ears, still numb from the chill of the day. 
Pleased to be there, with time yet to spare, the hairs nimbly squeezed in to stay. Another group of Arctic Fives have arrived. That's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Five Arctic hares whose ears dip and dive, five fat walrus with tusks sharp and keen, five sly ermine all pop-eyed and lean, five polar bears on pigeon-toed paws, and five snowy owls with long, curvy claws. Suspense filled the air, then out of nowhere came musk oxen stumbling topside. Twenty-five shuffled to make room they scuffled, for the new guys seemed overly wide. The oxen looked beat. When they stamped to their feet, snow spattered the entire throng. Once wedged into place, they stared into space and hoped nobody else came along. All right. One more group. How many is that, I wonder? That's five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Five musk oxen who timely arrive, five arctic hares whose ears dip and dive, five fat walrus with tusks sharp and keen, five sly ermine all pop-eyed and lean, five polar bears on pigeon-toed paws, and five snowy owls with long curvy claws. The white arctic hares hip-hopped everywhere, excited to get underway. Each fat walrus clapped, all five ermine yapped, and the polar bears started to sway. Then sheer energy from electricity was felt in the heart of each beast. There were snowy owl hoos and musk owl moos as a rainbow of hues flickered east. A soft frosty glow slowly covered the snow while bright colors lit the dim night. They had come to see a great mystery, the phenomenon called the Northern Lights. Let's spend a little time talking about our Arctic Fives and thinking about some math around our Arctic Fives. All right, so here's our groups. How many groups do you see? And how many in each group? Ah, hmm. oh, six groups with five in each group. Quite right. How many altogether do you suppose? Hmm, 30, I heard 30. You were quite correct if you said 30. And if you did, you solved this problem. Six times five equals 30. You might have just known that six times five equaled 30. Or you might have done some skip counting like we did in the story, repeated addition. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Or you might have even thought about groups inside of groups. Three groups of five is 15, and another three groups of five is 15, and that makes 30. What if one more group of Arctic fives arrived? How many would we have then? Can you use our model to picture it? How would you figure it out? There'd be seven, right? And if another group came, we would have 35 Arctic animals. So you solved the problem seven times five is 35. You might have just known it again. You might have thought about here's 30 and one five more gives me 35. So you might have counted on by fives from 30. And you solved seven times five. Seven groups of five, if we added another, makes 35. How many more groups would need to arrive for us to reach 45. This is a special kind of problem where we're missing a piece, right? It's a missing multipl multiplicand problem. So, hmm, how many more groups would we need? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Hmm, we'd need three more groups, wouldn't we? Three more groups of five. That might have been a tricky one. And you might have solved it by, again, counting on from 30, 30, 35, 40, 45. Three more groups of five is what we need to reach 45. Or 
you might have just known it again. Or you might have known 30 and 15 more will get us to 45, and that's five more fives. One more question. What if we had two icebergs full of Arctic fives? How many would we have? Two just like this. Can you picture it? Double that 30, and we get 60, and you've solved 30 times 2 equals 60. And there's lots of ways to know that. You might just know. You might have added 30 plus 30 to get 60. Or again, you might have done some counting by fives and tracked your counts on your fingers. Either way, you've solved 30 times 2 equals 60. Thank you guys for sharing another story with me today and for thinking about putting together groups to figure out how many. All right, you guys, I'm Mrs. Obenchain, and we are going to play a game to wrap things up today. Miss Carnes is going to help us. She's going to play. We'll just get these out of the way for right now. So the game we're going to play might be a game that you're familiar with, maybe or maybe not. It's called Yahtzee. You can buy this game at the store, or you can just, um, I got directions for it and a score sheet that we have a link for you on our website um, from a place called dicegamedepot.com. So if you just look out um, on Google, you can find directions for Yahtzee. It's a pretty common game. What you need for Yahtzee is five dice, and you can have a cup or you can just roll the five dice. Um, so what we do, you need a scoring sheet for Yahtzee, or at least you need to know, you can keep track on another piece of paper, but you need to know what um, each thing is worth. And so what you do is you roll five dice. Um, you can roll them up to three times, and you decide every time you roll them, how many of the dice you want to keep in order to try to build a scoring roll. And you can do things like keeping all your ones or your twos or your threes and so on. If you get enough points in the top half, you get a bonus. And the bottom half, things like a three of a kind means three of the same number or a four of a kind, four of the same number. And so we're going to play this game with you and just kind of talk about the dice that we get and what some of these different combinations are so that you can get a feel for how Yahtzee would go. So, should we rock, paper, scissors to see who goes first? Oh, sure. All right, Ms. I'm Obenchain going first. Goes first. Okay, so I got a one and then a three, a four, a five, and a six. So, right away, one of the things that's up here is called a small straight. It's just a sequence of four. So I'm gonna keep my three, four, five, and six. And I still have, I can re-roll this one a couple more times to see if maybe I could get a two, because that would be even a higher score. Oh, nope, I got a six. Up oh, and another one. So for me, I'm gonna take a small straight 30 points. I'm going to put that on my score sheet. All right. Miss Carnes goes. My turn. Okay. Whew. Well, I have two twos, a three, a five, and a six. Hmm. So. Hmm. Well, you can save your twos. I could save my twos. Let's see? I could, I think I will. I think I'll save my twos and I'll re-roll these other three. <gasps> All right. Mm, she got another two. I got another two. So since I have three twos, I'm gonna go ahead and re-roll my other dice to see if I can get any more twos. This is my last roll. Nope, shucks. So that means then I have three of a kind, so I get to total all of my dice. So three twos. Oh, you're going to go with that. Yeah. Because it could go two places, right? You could also just add your twos and keep twos. We could. Or you could do three of a kind, and then you add all your dice. But this way, I get the total of my twos plus the total of my other dice. So three twos gives me six, 
And then six more gives me 12, and three more gives me 15. Mm -hmm. All right, this time I got two threes, a four, a six, and a one. So I think I'm gonna keep my threes, because I could do the same thing and try to get three of a kind or four of a kind like Miss Cardness, or I could work on scoring my threes up here. I got two more threes. I get one more roll up oh, and I got a one. So I have four threes and a one, but I think I'm not gonna use my four of a kind because I'd like to try to get a higher score there than what my threes might give me, but that's not a bad score for, for just doing my threes. So I could count by threes, three, six, nine, 12, and I get 12 up here on my threes. Okay, Mrs. Obenshain is way in the lead so far. Let's see how I do. So I have two fives, a one, a two, and a six. <laughs> I think I'll keep my fives again and I'll roll my other dice. <gasps> oh, I don't have, I didn't get any more fives, but let's see, I do have a small straight, three, four, five, six. Mm. And you have one more roll. I have one more roll. So you so, can even ooh, see if you get a two and I get, get a, a large two. straight. Ooh, wow, that's, ah. nope. But I do have the small straight. So for the small straight, I get 30 points. Okay, I rolled and I have two sixes, a five and two ones. I'm gonna try for sixes, because those are high scores. Nope. I got one more six. So I might use that for my three of a kind. So three, three sixes is 18, right? Six, 12, 18. And then another two is 20 and 21. So I'm gonna use that for my three of a kind. Okay. There we go. Ha ha. All right, I have a four, a five, and a six, and two ones. Hmm. I really liked getting that straight, so I'm gonna roll my ones again. Oh. oh, okay, well, I have two fours, two sixes, and a five, but I can only do one two of a kind. Is that right? Yes. There's no, oh. two, you could do full house, you could try to get a full house mm. is two of one number and three of another number. She's got two fours and two sixes, so. Mm. Let's try it. Let's go for it. Mm. I kept my sixes. Well, now I have three sixes, so that's something to work with. Mm. So I get um, three of a kind for sixes and three sixes, six, 12, 18 would be my score. Okay, I have two sixes and I'll keep those. <gasps> I got two more sixes Ooh. and a five. Do I get one more roll? Did I roll? No, I think that was my third roll, huh? No. Roll. I think I get one more. <gasps> Ooh, I'm so, I glad got, you rolled. I'm so glad I rolled. I got five sixes. That's a Yahtzee. When you get five of one number, that's called a Yahtzee. And that is worth 50 points. So that is a big score. If you get more, that happening more than once, you get extra bonuses. And so every time that happens after you roll the first one, it's 100 points each. Wow, we so cool that we got to see a Yahtzee. I All hardly right. ever do that. <laughs> Rolling again. Let's see. I have two twos, a three, a five, and a six. Well. Wow. I'm just going to roll them all over again. <laughs> Which you can do. You don't have to keep any of them. Okay. Now I have two ones, a two, a four, and a six. Hmm. Well, you could keep your ones because your one is, is never going to be a high score. You're never going to get more than five on your ones, right? Here we go. Let's see. So that's kind of a throwaway. Two fours, a three, and two ones. So... I guess I need to use my fours, right? And that will give me eight on that one. Mm. 
So you kind of get the idea of how this game comes together. Um, you would keep playing until you had all of your boxes filled in. Every, you just keep going back and forth, and then you total each section, and then basically whoever has the highest score um, will win that. Uh, when you're rolling, you can choose if you want to keep them or not keep them, right? You get to choose. And this is a really fun game to play with your family, and so we would encourage you to try to get some out of your family to play with you. Um, and we want to thank you for joining us at uh, APS at home at eight with APS. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. Thanks, mathematicians.